Good evening. I'm Terry Thornton, Curator of Education at the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to being there, revisiting Tuesday evenings at the Modern, our online alternative to a long-running Tuesday evening lecture series. We are attempting, like so many others, to make sense of current circumstances as we strive to offer a meaningful experience within the realm of who we are and what we do as a museum of modern and contemporary art. Being there alludes to place, presence, and connection, which is what we hope to offer as we come together, engage, and possibly interact under the constraints of social distancing. Unfortunately, our on-site spring 2020 Tuesday evening schedule has been indefinitely postponed. But in the meantime, we are taking advantage of Tuesday evening's vast archive of more than 25 years to present something special and enriching each Tuesday on this YouTube channel from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Time. Last week, we began with a stunningly insightful and relevant presentation by Lucy Lepard, originally given on April 17, 2012, titled Undermine. Tonight, we are in for something different but equally engaging and profound as the artist Kara Walker delivers a slow, thoughtful, honest, and abundantly generous presentation in her September 23, 2008 Tuesday evening lecture in which she shares thoughts and musings on her work in relation to Kara Walker, My Compliment, My Enemy, My Oppressor, My Love, an exhibition that the Modern was so proud to be hosting at the time. Walker also uses this opportunity to give a telling and playful behind-the-scenes glimpse at the making of a video she was currently working on. Now, just to note, this presentation is from a time before we were recording video for public viewing. It was recorded instead for archive purposes, so it may look a little different than the Tuesday evening lectures from more recent years that you can now find on YouTube. Nevertheless, or maybe as a result, this is an incredibly special opportunity. Afterward, if you're so inclined, we will have a YouTube live chat, just a casual exchange to process what we experienced. Please hold your questions and comments to the end. Well, with that, let's get started. Tonight, of course, we are all here to hear from Kara Walker, the artist of the exhibition, Kara Walker, My Compliment, My Enemy, My Oppressor, My Love which opened at the Walker in Minneapolis and traveled to Paris, New York, and LA before coming here. It is an exhibition that has quite possibly stirred more interest than any other exhibition in the history of this museum. And that assessment is not um, based on sheer numbers, but on conversations, inquiries, and program participation that has grown out of an overwhelming response to the work that is as disturbing as it is beautiful, uh, challenging as it is compelling. This is work that won't be passively received, and in return, we all seem to um, be looking for um, every opportunity to talk about it, and as tonight's turnout indicates, hear about it. While I think Kara would agree that the art itself is in fact the source, the artist is certainly um, the next best thing, and we are very, very honored to have her here tonight. Um, I know that most of you have read everything you can find on the artist, her career, and the art, um, but for those of you who are new to her work, I would like to just um, mention that Kara is an artist who found her voice early, very, very early. Um, upon completing her MFA at RISD, Kara made her debut in 1994 at the Drawing Center in New York, and only three years later she received the MacArthur Genius Grant at the age of 28. <laughs> the rest is history, and I think we are living it with this exhibition. Naturally, her exhibition record is long and impressive, but most recently is worth mentioning that she was chosen by Robert Storr um, for the 52nd Venice Biennale, Think With Your Senses, Feel With Your Mind, which included her most recent film installation, The Angry Surface of Some Gray and Threatening Sea, as seen in this exhibition. And when I say most recent uh, film installation, I mean the most recent one in our exhibition. And then quite recently, she was included in Freedom American Sculpture, the Hague Sculpture um, 2008, of course, at the Hague. That exhibition recently closed, and um, she has an exhibition opening 
at the, uh, the Art Gallery of Ontario in Canada that opens in November, so I encourage you to book your tickets now. <laughs> but um, seriously, I think I'm convinced that in fact you can see a Carol Walker piece at any modern to contemporary museum in this country, as was my experience this weekend in Chicago at the Contemporary. And I have to say, it never gets old. It packs the same punch, and it keeps you coming back for more. So with that, please join me in welcoming Kara Walker. Thank you. Um, Set your expectations low. It's an artist's talk. Um, so this is the last leg of a, sort of a big show in my life. And it was I, I arrived yesterday and was stunned to see all this work again in a new context and to have it um, sort of elicit new responses from me. And one of the responses that I had was that it was like meeting my soul that had been sort of wandering, wandering the country and wandering different parts of the world, um, and, and discovering that, that I'm not the person that I think I am. <laughs> you know, that part of me has been living this cardboard cutout life over here, placidly moving along while this other entity has been sort of wreaking havoc and being sort of strange and, and funny and, and maybe a little bit dangerous and a little bit um, sick. Um, but today, I don't want to, I, I'm going to try not to kind of rehash what you already know and what you've already seen in the show, um, and I do want to try to talk a little bit about maybe where my work is going. One of the things that, um, uh, and I won't have any conclusions, um, and there will be a lot of questions. One of, one of the interesting um, aspects of this show in particular has been uh, its changing nature. Um, when it started out at the Walker, there was a very kind of set uh, list of uh, pieces that were going to be in the show and kind of a, a building, an arc from, say, the inception of, of an idea or some of my ideas about um, the visual and race and gender and sort of, you know, moving it over the years, you know, sort of kind of a, a narrative arc. and. Um, Philippe Verne, who curated the show, uh, always basically made me, you know, a real collaborator. It wasn't just the artist who was being um, showcased. Um, so he kept coming and getting more work. So I made a new piece for Venice. He wanted to include that piece in the show. Would I include that piece in the show? Yes. So instead of it being a retrospective where it ends and I fall off a cliff when this show closes. <laughs> It's, it's actually kind of done a very therapeutic um, uh, thing of you know keeping um, keeping the work alive in a way and keeping me feeling like okay this is part of a growing process and not um, you know 15 years and you're done. Um, but what I what I want to maybe um, embarrass myself with and share with you is a little behind the scenes look at a piece that I'm working on right now for, uh, for um, Canada. Um, because I started doing these films and videos a few years ago in, um, when was that, 2004 or something like that for the um, uh, grotesque show out in Santa Fe. Um, I'm kind of continuing in that vein, although that's not the only um, area uh, that I'm interested in. So, um, John, maybe <laughs> you could start running this uh, soundless series of clips. It's kind of goofy. It's almost a gag reel, but not entirely. Um, 
and you know for whatever reason you'll you'll be the only people who see um, the kind of goofing off that um, my editors and I do in in uh, the studio um, but what I've been what I've been working with in the last say year or so uh, partly as a way of kind of you know partly by way of thinking about transition and also um, just extending my thoughts about the types of narratives that interest me. I've been looking at uh, the uh, records from Freedmen's Bureau, the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands that uh, are pretty easily available online, but it's part of the National Archive. And um, um, because some of my interests right now are, are narratives or stories or the kind of voice, uh, the language behind victimization and um, the language of, say, the neutral observer of uh, uh, atrocities. Uh, I've been sort of parsing the records uh, as they relate to atrocities and riots and and uh, violence, and doing a number of different types of work with them, trying to maybe abstract them in some cases, and in other cases, draw out the narrative and sort of play with the, the almost soap operatic quality of the Southern Reconstruction and its very kind of human, fallible, um, sort of grotesque elements, um, but doing it with uh, the shadow puppets as I've been working with them previously and um, maybe trying a few other techniques thrown in. Uh, so all this, you know, is me goofing off with different characters. This is uh, trying different ways of projecting light and creating sort of vast landscapes. Um, but behind it all, the skeleton beneath all the, the, the play um, are um, snippets of stories that uh, I kind of extrapolate, ruin, uh, misinterpret, um, and and or uh, uh, turn into sort of dramatic reenactments of um, the sort of actual histories, or at least as actual as they can be, um, given their source. Um, so I'm just going to leave that playing as a kind of ruse and a distraction from the artist down here so, <laughs> so I can say whatever I want. So that's kind of what this work is about in some regards. Um, coming to this show and recognizing that there's a, a wandering soul that's somewhat disconnected from me and that I kind of meet uh, as I'm heading this way and it's heading that way. Uh, is reminiscent of the uh, experience of coming to this work in the first place. Um, but I'll get to that later, because I'm completely distracted by the image of that <laughs> on my little screen. <laughs> See, oh, look, there's me. Um, there's a... Um, a story, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the, 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 the idea of me meeting myself uh, in a moment. Um, all, all this that you're observing up, up on the screen is um, me sort of trying my hand at being um, less of a solo pl practitioner. I have um, in the course of trying to work with film and video had to you know, employ other people to help out. And so I have a few assistants coming in every now and then. This summer was maybe the busiest time I've had in the studio, at least with the number of people um, coming in and out, um, the number of hands. And um, for the most part, we're all amateurs. You know, there's, there's not been a concerted attempt to um, make a a film that's very slick. We're still trying. I still, I'm still very interested in the um, sort of herky-jerky qualities of the silhouette and of the kind of uncertain nature of truth and the um, um, the sort of clumsy and childlike innocence that I sometimes stumble upon um, 
terrible, terrible events. Um, so for the most part, this summer looked a lot like play and playing with dolls and um, playing with editing and playing with history and playing with my own relationship to uh, that history. Uh, where am I? You know, it's 2008 and I'm looking at uh, 1868 and I become interested in 1868 because on November 26th, 1868, uh, you know, 101 years before my birth, something happened. And so I find, you know, some kind of interest in the absurdity of looking to, to that um, date or that moment um, as, uh, as uh, the absurdity of being the artist who looks to that for, for inspiration. Um, in any case, there are two narratives that I've been working with this summer, but I'm hoping to maybe expand uh, that to another eight, maybe. <laughs> Just eight is kind of a good lucky number, it seems. Um, I'm going to stop that for now. Um, when Hey, John, when um, I want to switch over to the computer. When I started thinking about the black woman in art, I started by reading little stories. And then I started writing little stories. Um, and what was interesting to me in reading bad stories, mostly romance novels, things like that, cheap stories. Um, what was interesting, one was that I was looking at cheap stories, but I had my own ulterior motives for that. Um, I was interested in sort of meeting that unrecognizable self, similar to the one that I found here. Here she is. I was interested in this chica here. <laughs> in about 1991, 1992, I think, I got this postcard from someone. And um, I didn't quite know what to do with it, um, what it meant why I was given it. And uh, I was painting at the time, uh, trying to anyway. I was a recent graduate from the Atlanta College of Art and um, <coughs> always had kind of an interest in bodies and sort of this sort of turgid relationship to sexuality and, you know, uh, a discomfort with um, sort of confinement. And uh, then I had this picture, and I looked at this picture for a long, long time, trying to figure out what it was uh, about her or it that was so significant to me. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that's fascinating for me, and I, I, I hope that this is reflected in, in um, aspects of my work, is that there's uh, here's an object postcard, and there's on this object an, an image, and the image is both an icon and and a um, you know a human, <laughs> and um, and there's a, a part of me, you know, the kind of narrative, diaristic, you know, female, you know, who looks at this girl and identifies with her, and there's another part of me that that identifies with the artist who made her into what. Uh, that image represents. And um, I'm very interested in the way that the language, some class A, is um, kind of ventriloquized. You know, it's uh, imposed on her. Perhaps maybe it's my own longing that uh, character characterizes her as having spoken the words given to her. Um, 
and meaning them. And so there's an image and an icon and a person, and then there's the object, which is a piece of paper, which has on one side this image and on the other side some writing, some text that was meant for some other kind of lateral uh, communication. And then around the edges, there's a whole other set of sorts of meanings that can't be seen because of their flatness. They can't be um, really heard very well unless, I don't know, I guess unless you reduce yourself to a certain size or unless you enlarge the piece such that you can see what all is happening between the layers of the image and the, and the uh, sort of lateral communication and what's happening out here in the world that looks at that icon. And I uh, identified with all of that, sort of the enormity of you know, being in the front and in the middle and behind and on the sides. And, um, and I found myself kind of attracted to the, the sort of nostalgia bug. I was always kind of interested in, in romance and nostalgia, but in a queasy and discomforting way. Um, but this, this image kind of brought me to the point where I could maybe more comfortably address my black body and the way that it has moved through uh, the world that sometimes sees it as an icon and sometimes an object and sometimes a romanticized victim and sometimes uh, a figure of contempt and sometimes a figure uh, to be lauded. Um, so I, when I got to RISD, it wasn't for a little while that I really decided to kind of take it on. Prior to that, prior to graduate school and moving away from Atlanta, I had avoided the subject altogether. <laughs> so this is moving on uh, about 17 years or something <laughs> um, from my last show at uh, Brent Sycama. Um, maybe some kinds of transitions, maybe trying to rediscover the painterly if possible. Um, after this show was conceived, it was up, it was touring, I was walking around with it, um, I started thinking about, and, and I was having to talk about it, uh, I found myself constantly sort of addressing this little story, once again from graduate school, but um, that was all my prior experience before I started showing. Um, um, I, I, I kept talking about my relationship to painting, how I started making these cutouts kind of as a rejection of a kind of patriarchal vision of painting that I didn't find, I couldn't find a place for myself within, uh, or that I wanted to kind of insinuate myself uh, into while rejecting it out of hand. And so through writing and drawing and, you know, and kind of battling with oil paint and canvas and all of that, I eventually kind of came to a point where removing the, removing the image was sort of a more visceral and more important kind of act um, than applying a mark to canvas. So this is maybe a throwback, but I kind of like the way it looks. And um, it's a, a kind of a rumination on painting and objects and making objects instead of making um, I don't know, like there's something about the work in this show and the way it, it unfolds that I kind of think is kind of like unmaking objects, you know, keep, you know if I'm making a, an installation then I decide I'm going to make drawings instead and if I don't want to do drawings then I make films. And so it's kind of like as soon as I get kind of caught in one corner I start kind of working my way out of it. And with painting, uh, you're sort of like setting limits. Um, <clears throat> so I did a small group of kind of semi, semi, you know, five by seven 
panels with a kind of a quilty uh, motif. And while I was working on these, I was writing and trying to think about what the hell painting means to me now, if anything. And I found this incredibly difficult. <laughs> Setting, um, these kind of, setting up these confined spaces and kind of meeting my old, maybe pre-graduate school uh, demons all at the same time um, as they kind of um, borrow from the silhouette work and um, um, stick their you know, images right in the middle and um, sort of vaguely comment on sort of the quilting phenom from G's Bend and um, make sort of vague references to, to uh, um, abstraction. But all of that was kind of in, in, I don't know, I guess in keeping with a kind of a quest or a, a sense that what I'm doing as an artist is a bit of a, uh, quest for, um, for meaning, and a meaning that resembles a life that I actually live, and the body that I have, and the history that is kind of contained in that, that body, um, and the fictions that are contained in that body, the fantasies. Um, these are somewhat smaller uh, panels with paper cut out collage. Um, one of the kind of convoluted thoughts that went into my thinking about these objects um, was how I, I, I guess where I am right now in uh, teaching a little bit and encountering other artists in New York and at Columbia um, is a kind of the, the way that I denigrated painting when I was in graduate school seems different than the way that painting is denigrated <laughs> at Columbia. Um, and um, and I, I began to kind of associate painting like this image with, um, with like that body, that lynched body um, in the corner. And maybe this is um, sacrilege, it probably is. Um, but um, I kind of wanted to make an image like this that was um, um, laudatory of that, I don't know, of that body. You know, it's like Billie Holiday is singing Strange Fruit or something. It's kind of like, here's this practice um, that is sort of denigrating to its own body somehow. But, um, creating um, images with figures in them is kind of maybe not what it once was, or is maybe a little bit poor, you know? It's a little bit um, anti-intellectual. And, um, and I kind of wanted to situate myself sort of under that tree where this lynched painting was hanging and examine this relationship between the painter and the mob, <laughs> the mob that maybe will crit critique it or tear it apart or destroy it, and the um, object itself, the painting or the body. So I was writing a piece called, you know, painting as a lynched black man or something like that, something kind of horrible, and then trying to kind of resuscitate it and and, and look at its um, possibilities. Um, anyway, I hadn't talked about this work at all, so you know, forgive me for stumbling around a little bit. So there were these small objects in each one. Uh, these paper pieces were quick um, studies um, with titles drawn from the Freedmen's Bureau of atrocities and deaths and murders. Um, and they were arranged something like that. I really just wanted them kind of floating there. <clears throat> the larger paintings had other slightly more elaborate titles, and they, they kind of fell under a slightly different uh, rubric um, about 
uh, beauty and objects. And then there were these pieces, which are in the show here, the text pieces. And by the time I got to them, I was so sort of furious and fed up about my painting ex exercise um, because I kept coming back to um, the act in the studio as being one of um, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Uh, a victim and victimizer kind of construct. And, uh, and I was trying to get away from it, and yet I kept finding myself in sort of the role of a perpetrator, you know, sort of heaping this act upon a, a piece of paper, or upon a canvas, or upon a, uh, uh, a board. Um, so I wound up doing these text pieces, which were um, mostly, they were all automatic writing. Um, and, but before I started writing, I was thinking, well, at this stage of the game, you're just getting caught up in images, you're just getting caught up in sort of iconography and pleasure, and this is not about that. You know, if you're talking about a painting being something like that lynched body in those trees and those images that you've been looking at, then this is not about like, you know, blowing people away with with um, sort of you know these little, little artful turns. So I just um, tried to pare everything down to just uh, language and sort of growls and shouts and and sort of spurts of of sort of vitriol and 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 sort of vile sort of it's like painting in a way. Was, if I was talking about it in the way that I was thinking, then it was a kind of a vile act. <laughs> um, so that's how this group of images came about, or objects, or words, or poems, or I'm not sure what they are, but um, <clears throat> by the time the show rolled out, I thought, well, this is the painting, and everything else is kind of like a sketch to get to it. I don't have details of them because you can see them yourself. <clears throat> so, in a way, coming around to uh, a thought about painting or image making as, as being uh, kind of a cruel space for an artist, or a cruel site where an artist kind of exploits her fantasies, kind of takes me back to this image. Um, it takes me back to Atlanta, and it takes me back to, even I'm being nostalgic now, it takes me back. It takes me back to uh, uh, a series of thoughts that led me to want to not make paintings. Um, I recall pretty distinctly sitting in uh, a studio in, well, what passed for a studio in Atlanta, um, and looking at this image and looking at a blank canvas and thinking, well, you know, in order to, every time you paint a body, you're sort of forcing this entity, you're forcing this kind of living s substance, this living being in a way to do your bidding, you know, like being a painter is no better than being some slave master, you know, and you're just forcing, you know, color to do your bidding and you're forcing, you know, uh, say figures to do your bidding. And I wasn't really working figuratively, uh, at least not in the way that this, sh this show um, exemplifies, but that's, that's, that was my sort of major conundrum, you know? How can I be a black girl making a painting? You know, is it a contradiction? Is it, you know, is it something that's not done? And it's not that I wasn't looking at uh, other black women artists or other black artists, but I was looking and I wasn't liking what I was seeing so much. I was, and I think um, the reason for that was I felt um, I think because of, say, my upbringing or um, my um, 
or, or, or I don't know, whatever, a lot of different reasons, I felt like I couldn't make uh, a work that would be kind of easily received because there was already kind of a received notion of what black art would say, you know, to a black audience or to a white audience. And I felt sort of disingenuous uh, that I would be and probably had been called out uh, as being sort of maybe not black enough or not, um, yeah, not black enough. I was mostly called out for not being black enough by my white teachers, oddly enough. Um, <laughs> Um, and, you know, so those kinds of constructs were what were interesting to me, but um, I, it was very hard, as, you know, particularly at 20 or 19, to find a place to, or even know how to engage, you know, your contradictory impulses and your contradictory self. Um, so I've come sort of in a zigzaggedy <laughs> circle back to the same image. Um, and this is very weird because um, I think, although I never scripted a talk before, the last couple of times I mostly said the same things and this time I haven't said anything that I know. <laughs> I don't know what I said. <laughs> um, so, I, but I would like to do the following um, because I, get a lot of questions about my work, raises a lot of questions, and, um, and let's see, this is the most masochistic thing I can do is say, okay, please ask them. Um, please ask me questions because um, I will probably have answers. Um, I'll have a few answers and then I'll have some non-answers that won't satisfy some of you. Um, well, you uh, say that uh, you identified, uh, if I understood correctly, with the, uh, the, the lynched uh, 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 person, the lynched black male. And uh, it, it seems to me that you, uh, you know, very, there's no ambiguity, man. I mean, I, I go to the show and uh, I, it, it is, uh, you know, it, it, it's powerful for me. It uh, uh, brings moments of, of my own of white growing up and the kind of uh, treatment in the uh, community that I was reared uh, that uh, uh, Negroes received. Black people, um, I, Negroes, colored. I don't, I don't see any ambiguity at hmm? all. I mean, it, it, you don't see any ambiguity in my work? It seems to me you're implying that there is in your own mind, in your own experience. Yeah, well, I mean, my own experience is I grew up in 19, I grew, was born in 1969, you know, um, and my own experience embraces uh, the Civil Rights Act, it embraces uh, a feeling. I grew up not recognizing that there was uh, anything but equality, you know? I grew up in, partly in California, and I went to Martin Luther King Elementary School, and my view of the world was shaped by um, uh, what I believed to be a reality that, you know, you could grow up uh, any color, any gender, you know, any shape and achieve good things. So my experience, the work is um, born out of that experience and then it's sort of met up with later on in life the story that you're telling me in a way. Well, when you went to Georgia then that really slammed you. It was, it, 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 well, let's say it didn't slam me against the wall. Let's say um, that over a period of time, many events were peculiar and odd and strange and I couldn't make sense of and they were possibly even dangerous at times. And, um, but the, 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 the person that I am, the, the place that this work comes out of is um, the sort of, I mean, 
not to be too like romantic and literary, but I always kind of identified with Candide, you know, like just kind of tripping into stupid situations and um, and thinking, well, everything's going to come out all right, you know. And um, so, in some ways, this this work, part of this work, comes out of that kind of idiocy and innocence, and the other part comes out of a kind of real um, sort of furious recognition that, you know, maybe had I not been such an idiot, you know, I might have gotten really hurt, you know? So um, that's, I, I, I do think that there's an ambiguity, or at least I'm, I'm hoping for a kind of uh, a sense of, um, you know, I'm not out there telling it like it is necessarily, you know? Um, but I, I do make the work from an honest place even if sometimes I get the facts mixed up. Yes? Hi, uh, can you address some of the overt sexuality in your work? Um, how would you like me to address it? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean... But, um, I'm just curious because it's, it's very overt. Yeah, no, well, I, I mean, you know, I think even before I was making, I think I kind of alluded to it when I was in, you know, college. I mean, the, my interest was kind of in bodies and bodies um, trying to undo the confinement of being in the bodies that they're in. Um, so sometimes, you know, they were just exuberantly sexual and um, sometimes um, frighten, frighteningly sexual. Um, but I think also, um, you know, that was also part of, part of my, uh, you know, young adult grow and adulthood experience was where um, sex and intimacy and bodies um, meet, you know, all histories and um, violence and everything also kind of, I mean, my, one of the, um, I guess I might have said this before, but, you know, I had the experience of kind of, you know, being in a situation and then suddenly, um, you know, race is touched upon just very, very slightly and suddenly it's like a chasm opens up, right? And so, you know, the intimate moment sort of changes shape, it changes form. And I mean, I, I think um, I wanted the work to contain that kind of visceral chasm. And I wanted the work to also um, create a space for seduction, I think. You know, I mean, I think the way the work looks and the way um, I draw, I mean, some of that is just the way that I draw. But, um, you know, I was never interested in um, angry artwork that repelled people because people get an, a sense of like, oh, she's just an angry black girl and, you know, rah, rah, rah. and then, you know, brothers and sisters come along and say, yes, you know, angry black girl. And I just, I just didn't, I just didn't want to have that sort of be that cut and dried, you know? Um, I think the, the work comes from a much weirder sort of unsettled place and, um, and I think, yeah, sex and sexuality can be that weird and unsettling sort of location for sort of, I guess, an engagement. But the seduction thing is, you know, can, can you bring all of this material, you know, into a space and have people actually want to look at it, you know, or feel compelled to look at it despite um, one's better judgment or interest. Um, you talked about your text works kind of like carrying down the essentials of your preparation. Mm -hmm. But I guess I have a couple questions. One in like how in writing something is mm -hmm. it less colonizing and forcing a figure to what you want, like mm -hmm. forcing words to. Mm -hmm. And then also it seems like a lot of your text is aesthetically really pleasing. So mm -hmm. I was wondering, is that, mm -hmm. um, is, in, in the aesthetics of your, of your text, are you still just trying to get across what the text is saying, or is it some sort of duo? 
I think it's probably the duel, although, um, uh, yeah, I guess I think even with those ink pen and, or ink and brush pieces, there was a way I was still talking about painting in the most sort of rudimentary terms, I guess. <laughs> and, um, and with the text, I mean, I think of it, it's like, you know, language is hard, and this, you know, language is hard, and uh, and trying to speak the stuff that sort of percolating is harder for me anyway. I mean, I don't um, just I don't do well with it, and um, um, so for the most part, most of the time. I guess there's some of the typed pieces in the show, and I type, and some of the typing is just mine and private and working out, you know, the noise. And um, and some of it I'm really kind of happy with, you know, and then it's like I like the way it sounds or the, like the cadence of it. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, there is a, a little bit of a, an imbalance. I do want it to be seen or, or heard in some way, but I don't think that I really want to, you know, I don't know that there are pieces I want to recite or, I, you know, I don't know, you know, like other ways that I would want to bring them across other than sort of on the page. And I think that that might come from that early, earlier influence of sort of reading, you know, romance novels and pornographic novels and, you know, just like thinking about the way like the, something is kind of abstract as a written word can elicit, you know, all this kind of emotion and feeling and, you know, stuff like that. So, um, I don't know if that completely answers, but, well. Just a minute. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. Obviously, you know your work can elicit very divisive responses. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how you hope what your intent is, maybe, mm -hmm. um, by going back is that somehow, do you hope or do you think it moves people forward in thought of whether your mm -hmm. subject matters? You mean with this recent body of work or um, well, moving back towards me? Back to the civil war era. Oh. Mm -hmm. No. It listens to very, mm -hmm. sometimes very divisive. I've had many conversations about right. the show that are very um, heated. Yeah. And um, it surprises me mm -hmm. that people aren't Do you think people don't get yeah. It kind of depends on where it's shown, frankly. I mean, honestly, I think um, there's a more of an ironic distance in, you know, in New York and New England and places about the kind of um, the ruse of Civil War, you know, costume drama that I use in, in the work and then, say, in the South, where it's just like it's kind of present and palpable and I think I mean that's kind of why I went back to it in the first place was like here's this uh, narrative that sort of arches over and influences in its quiet way you know how people today are you know moving through their lives and it's not just placards on a you know on a sign on the side of the road it's like if you touch on it, it, it's all there somehow. And I mean, I'm kind of fascinated in um, just how, um, I don't know, I, I mean, I'll retract the fascinated part, but I, I mean, my, my other interest, one of my interests for a long time has been sort of just mythology and that that film, Eight Possible Beginnings, was kind of like a little attempt at just putting that out there, like, hey, these are mythologies that, and mythologies aren't myths that, you know, I mean, mythologies are working sorts of um, phantoms and principles that define um, our lives. And if we think, you know, if we're still thinking about race and race and race, then, you know, it has a kind of an underlying uh, location, you know, for in America, let's say. And, you know, you can extend it um, in a number of different ways, transatlantic and um, uh, middle passage and all of that. But my interest was kind of like, okay, so here I am in this location and it has a, um, you know, in in the South when I was there and, it, and there's, uh, 
like a river that just kind of runs underneath, like a little underground river. So, um, so that's why I did that. Um, I'm moving forward into reconstruction now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I was interested in the process by which you come up with, end up with certain of your silhouettes. If you take the Uncle Tom, for example, and the Take the three women and baby mm -hmm. and that how what process does that evolve out of? Mm -hmm. uh, so that you're saying something that you really want to say is does it come out of narrative or how does it evolve? It's kind of I mean there's a there's sort of maybe two things, maybe three going on at the same time. One is a you know in, reading um, Uncle Tom's Cabin way back when I read it and um, what that piece grew out of, I was thinking about um, Harriet Beecher Stowe and I was feeling very critical of this kind of feminized maternal character that I thought Uncle Tom was being sort of interpreted as. He was a very sort of, um, yeah, just a nurturing character. and. Uh, and I also was equating that sort of nurturing, slightly feminized um, male, feminized male as, um, you know, I mean, I was also relating it to, you know, my own father, you know, and thinking about sort of what it is to be kind of uh, just nurtured and thinking, and then sort of extrapolating from there different sorts of thoughts on, you know, ingestion and nurturing and rejecting and, um, um, so, you know, on the one hand, there's like the Harriet Beecher Stowe kind of criticism, um, and then there's my own sort of self-criticism and, and sort of pairing those things up. And while I'm doing that, I'm just drawing, you know, and, and so some of the images are maybe more like the little Ava character sort of chopping off her head, you know, as opposed to cutting her locks and giving them to the slaves. Was, um, just my sort of fury at, at how this child steals the show and becomes a martyr and a hero. And, um, and then the, the women, the sort of totem of women, grew out of some drawings. There, I think in the back gallery, there were several drawings that were from the kind of thinking process for the Uncle Tom piece. And um, yeah, I was thinking about milk and breastfeeding and sort of, um, and, and also titillation and, you know, just like creating this, this, um, I wasn't even thinking about creating. I'm not even gonna say creating. I was drawing. <laughs> and I was drawing very directly um, what I felt to be uh, both extremely sort of compelling and maybe, um, I don't want to say unseemly, but sort of out, outside of a kind of a mainstream image of how nurturing should feel, you know, how nurturing should be. I thought it was the one image that um, even my mother said had, I forget how she worded it, but she said it was kind of beautiful. <laughs> I think she was completely shocked by it, but she thought it was kind of beautiful. So the drawing is going on while you're thinking, and the image evolves. It's it's a multiple part process in a way, and sometimes it synthesizes in the silhouette. Yes. Uh, you continue to think you continue your work to uh, explore racism. Is the problem you plan to get into other problems that affect the Afro American community? I always get that. I think I address that in uh, one of the note card pieces. Oh. I, um, the, the text pieces on the wall, there's a large group, I think I showed them, um, are largely about uh, ideas of perpetrating injustice and receiving it and um, complicating the language between uh, uh, violator and victim. Um, and that work kind of picks up 
where my listening to and reading of the news leaves off. It's not entirely racial, black, white in America, uh, although that's part of my focus, um, but it is uh, an, an attempt to kind of embrace, um, yeah, just to embrace basically the same concerns, but without the hoop skirts. Yes. Um, I'd like to thank you for your work. Um, I'm from the Deep South, and I, like you in California, growing up with a certain sort of insulation mm -hmm. from how things are in other parts of the country, um, my childhood memories are very positive with regard to race and stuff, because um, despite where I live. Mm -hmm. uh, after seeing your work, and also like Beloved, you know, mm -hmm. different things that have made you sort of go back at my advanced age and re examine what my memories are, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, from a different perspective. And I thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Because uh, my friends here with me know exactly mm -hmm. been a process for me. I've been here several times and it's really uh, helped me grow. And uh, I thank you for the great time. Oh, thank you. Thank That's you. very nice. Um, so maybe I can do two more questions. One more question. <laughs> Somebody further back who I haven't seen, maybe. Further back, further back. <laughs> I know you have a good question. Further back. <laughs> Yeah, the question was what, if I thought about using fabric because of the quilting reference, but I actually, I kind of didn't want to go there. I think that, you know, I kind of, I maybe thought about it for a second and then I thought, well, no. <laughs> um, okay, I saw you first, I'm sorry. Can you talk a bit about the process you went through moving from the more static silhouettes to mm -hmm. the shadow puppets? Um, to the moving pictures. Yeah, I, well, it seemed like, because once I started cutting, cutting paper, you know, it became like, it, 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 there's a tradition. And uh, it seemed kind of inevitable that you know, if I was going to try working this way, I would try all the sort of different parameters. But it took me forever. I think I bought a Super 8 camera in maybe 1996 or something, and I didn't make a film with it until 2004 because I didn't trust it somehow. Because I grew up with you know sort of physical media and painting and printmaking, and you know, and then I was cutting. So there's always something to do, and I just didn't believe that if I pushed the button something would happen. <laughs> so for a while it was just a trust issue. So um, what I wound up doing was um, I did the, um, those projection pieces first as a way of just thinking about light. Because I kind of felt like I needed to move through um, sort of the experience of you know, making a shadow and then being a part of the shadow. And then, then maybe I could understand how a film might work if you were pushing a positive through this, um, or affecting a, a negative with light. And so, um, but it was sort of a natural extension just for, you know, history's sake to, you know, look at um, uh, what's her name, Lottie Reiniger and some other um, silhouette artists and filmmakers from the 20th century and um, think about, okay, well, Maybe I can make a small story because I mean the work already is speaking kind of about elliptical narratives and and um, and it has a kind of liquid motion to it. You know, you move from this piece or you move outwards this way. And, um, but it's a whole different thing. You know, it's a whole different process and um, requires a little bit more. Well, it doesn't require it, but for me, I needed a little bit more organization and a little bit more. Um, uh, ability to communicate to others, you know, what the beginning, middle, and end is, even if they all change in the editing room. Um, and um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of enjoying it. I actually, um, we could, you know, go back to that little video um, and finish watching it. 
um, in the meantime. Uh, but I think my feeling is right now, you know, there's a lot of different ways that I can go, I guess, with film. But um, as with all these different uh, media that I work with, when it starts to kind of close down, I kind of want to open up another door and <laughs> see what can happen. So I'm, I'm not sure what that something will be, but um, but it's been it's been pretty um, enlightening. So. Your your movement from uh, you had mentioned uh, early on from pink because that was taking the body and human body, mm -hmm. and it was almost too much, uh, it was too intrusive on yourself, like, and what you have is so, so graphic, I don't see how it can be more graphic than what you've done in this remarkable uh, uh, work mm -hmm. of paper, mm -hmm. the movement from pain that almost pressed you out, it seems to me, into the cutout. Um, it was kind of a social pressing out. I felt uh, excluded. Um, does that my two questions? Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now everybody's getting all into this now. <laughs> I'm like, I'm ready to go. Okay. <laughs> you, you had answered a few questions that probably dealt with uh, the sexual overtones of the mm -hmm. tones in your work mm -hmm. but I, I think one of them listed Personal being. No. It's almost like it's, you put it out there, but you don't have, it doesn't evoke that anger that I would feel. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if part of that would be preface with our age differences. Mm -hmm. It's like you've observed it, this is what it is. And this is just how no, I've always, no. oh no, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm sorry I'm interrupting. I mean, it's just how I've always kind of been like this, although I was quieter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm less quiet now, but this is about the extent of it. Um, but are some of the, do some of the pieces invoke a level of anger for mistreatment of women and how women have been treated over the years? I want to get into all the mm -hmm. political yeah, yeah, yeah. that. But for me, when I see it, I get yeah. Okay, let's. Well, I'm not still looking at from you, and you were like, oh, yeah, it's a. Uh, well. No, no. Well, I mean, but well, that's true. But I mean, my my my. Um, I I grew up, I think, in the Victorian era. I'm not sure in my household. So, um, we we are very polite, <laughs> um, and um, um, you know, these talks are so hard because there's two thousand people in here or something, and. Um, <laughs> My um, and I and I have this kind of rule that I keep breaking, which is to try and speak about the work without referencing biography. But it's really hard to do in a way because the work kind of references biography. <laughs> and um, but I think uh, in the most vague terms, I can say my I was fascinated as a kid at how um, at the sort of dichotomy of being in this sort of reserved and quiet and sort of forward-thinking household and have, say, one member of that household be like, like what that feeling you were talking about that comes out in the work. Um, and how, you know, yeah, how you can have this sort of, I don't know what to call it anymore, this explosive element, you know, be a part of the family and I'm interested in that way of kind of enveloping, you know, and even absorbing and maybe even enabling that um, personality to kind of continue to exist, uh, even as sort of damaging as it can be. And um, um, yeah, and but I've, I think even as, not as super young, but say in college, you know, the work was kind of like, 
you know, and I would make a you know, 12 foot painting and, a, you know, <laughs> so maybe make something bigger, but I didn't say a word. <laughs> um, and, and, and no, um, you know, I think I have absorbed a fair amount of, of this work and new work that comes out of me comes out of me like, um, I think I was alluding to it earlier, it comes out of me like this sort of deranged and sick child that you kind of have to love because it's yours. <laughs> and, you know, it's not anybody else's and it's not the person who made that, you know. And it's, it's my own kind of um, wrong-headed beast. And, um, you know, you don't have to like it. <laughs> and and, you, and it, it, I do like, um, I've always, I think, been more appreciative of, of artwork that elicited something in me that maybe was akin to anger or jealousy or rage or a whole combination of things that I couldn't assimilate. And I think, um, yeah, I wanted to do that <laughs> in some ways. And I, and I, I apparently I have. <laughs> so. Yeah, and you didn't have because it does have that, you know, mm -hmm. the range of emotions mm -hmm. that you tend to feel. So it's not like to say it's, I'm mm -hmm. not saying it's bad. I'm mm -hmm. saying I didn't get that feel, but that mm -hmm. was one of the, one of the mm -hmm. feelings that you did have. But right. listening to you answer the question, obviously yeah. that is one of the emotions that you kind of have, but I didn't think it's Yeah, no, it's, you know, it's, it's just, it's, okay. it's there, but it's more in the studio, I think. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so hey, that seems like a good place to end. 